Well, you know, I'm sort of Deepak Vintage. Uh, grew up in India, got my undergraduate degree, came here about four decades ago. And the first three decades were about being a graduate student, getting a PhD, being a prof, and then being an entrepreneur. And, and I had the good fortune of being, doing about 10 companies or so. But what I want to talk about is the last decade. And last decade, my wife Jayshree and I, you know, we've been toying around with innovation, creativity on one side, relevance, compassion, consciousness on the other side, and how do you really put them together to, to really create the impact? And, and the journey actually started with MIT. I, I, I joined the board of MIT about 13 years ago, and, and MIT is obviously a very creative place, and they come up with lots of great ideas. Uh, you know, a lot of the companies we started in the 70s, 80s were all ideas that came out of Bell Labs, and, they'd all, and they were, by 2000, they were all gone. And so the center of gravity for new ideas had clearly moved back to universities. And, and so we wanted to see if you could actually have university ideas have a bigger impact. And so we, we launched a pretty serious campaign. Uh, we, we did a center there for technological innovation at MIT. We invested about $20 million. And the idea behind this center is very simple. For technological innovation, you know, you start with a creative idea, a big innovation. But that innovation does not have impact unless it's directed to some burning problem in the world. So you need that compassion. And, and so we, uh, you know, the reason why you need this is because to create a, a creative environment, you have to create an environment which is conducive for creativity. However, most of those creative people have a desire for impact. But over the course of time, slowly the environment becomes clubby and clubby. And then the people who come up with these creative ideas get more into impressing each other as opposed to having the impact. And so having a conscious process to actually connect them back to compassion is sort of what we did at the center. And, uh, and it's been a pretty good result in, in the last 10 years. And now it's become a national model. And, and US taxpayers spend about $150 billion a year in funding research and I co-chair a council for Obama, and we're sort of applying a lot of these ideas there. But this is not what I want to talk to you about. I, what I really want to talk to you today about is the social innovation. So about eight years ago, uh, we said, well, what can we do about this in India? And, and somehow technological innovation in India didn't sound as exciting as social innovation. And for social innovation, that equation gets turned around. It really starts more with compassion and then you bring creative ideas. Uh, so really a deep understanding of the problem itself is more critical than the idea. Because the idea that you apply to actually solve the problem does not have to be patentable, first time in the world, huge competitive advantage, and so on. So leading with a true compassion and true understanding of the problem itself is, is the secret of true social innovation. So we came up with the concept called social innovation sandbox. And, and so the sandbox meaning it's, it's a limited area, about four or five districts. But even that in India is about 10 million people. It's not a Bangalore. And so we built a center. A local architect built a center for us. And, and it's a pretty serious effort. We have about 70 people on the payroll. And uh, we've had over 100 young men and women from US go and spend time in that area. But then, very quickly, we realized that social innovation does not happen without local leadership. So we started a lot of local leadership programs. And, and for example, you know, a lot of the college kids in India mostly memorize answers and get good grades. And so we said, that cannot be true. So we started a program where four college kids come together, pick a problem in the society, and solve it. So today, we have about 10,000 students doing 2,500 projects. And, and it's, a, it's a great exercise in this consciousness because, number one, it, it builds the consciousness because you don't walk around the society just noticing problems, but you do something about them. And secondly, you know, most of the problems exist in this world because they're constrained, they're deadlocked. You can't do anything about it because of whatever reasons. And when you find a way to unknot that problem and actually solve that problem, does not matter whether it's a small problem or a big problem, it's a hugely empowering experience. And so giving that empowering experience to these students has been sort of a big part of it. 
And then we have programs where uh, we train young men and women to be social entrepreneurs. And, and we're working with about 50 uh, different interventions. And, and, and the way we work with these interventions is to work very similarly the way you build companies. I mean, first you start with what is the innovation, but you have the people who live there, who actually know what the things they want to do, come up with the solutions. But once they come up with the solutions, then you help them use all the things that you'd use in building a good business. And, and so one of these 50 programs is a program called Food for Education, Akshay Patra, which Deepak has mentioned quite a few times over the last couple of days, and I and Deepak are very passionate about this program. So I want to spend about five minutes talking about this program. So a lot of the children in India come hungry to schools. And government has a program to actually feed all the 120 million children a hot midday meal. But then it doesn't get executed. You know, there's no infrastructure. So a teacher has to cook in the corner of a room, teach, and also feed. And so this particular organization said, well, maybe we can use advanced engineering, supply chain, procurement, accounting, all the good things that you'd use in a business and solve the problem. So they built a kitchen in the sandbox that we have. And from that one kitchen, they make 185,000 meals, 185,000 meals every day. And then they load them up in these trucks. And every school gets three vessels and they distribute the food to uh, 185,000 children from this one kitchen. And so let me just play a video for you. It's a short video, but it gives you a feel for the kind of things that, that happen. And the, you know, it's, it's not what experts in US designed for these kids there. It's actually local cuisine, local produce. So for example, in the north, in the south people eat rice. In the north people eat these rotis. And so this particular machine they designed makes 60,000 rotis every hour, right? But that's what you need. If you have to feed 150,000 children from a kitchen, that's what you need. And so, and, and, the, and, the, and even, you know, a lot of the nonprofits, uh, you think about nonprofits as, as companies or organizations that don't really have those capabilities uh, to really run like a big business or a, or a very efficient company. But this particular organization, you know, we heard yesterday from SAP. So this organization actually uses SAP to manage their inventory. So they know how much commodities they have, how much rice they have, how much lentils they have, everything right on the SAP system. They use GPS for all their vehicles so that you can track every vehicle. Uh, you have uh, route optimization software because 20% of the cost of the providing the food is in actually transportation. And so if you have to take 30, 40 vehicles and serve to these 150, 180,000 children, uh, you really need to optimize the, uh, the routes. Uh, and then, uh, you know, recycle the energy. The, every kitchen has an ISO process so that you can actually ensure that there's quality and there's food safety standards and so on. So you can see that you can actually do these interventions by using techniques that we use all the time in, in, in competing in, in for profit. 
So the cost, you know, it's unbelievable. Yesterday, in fact, President Fox couldn't believe that you could actually serve a meal for 12 cents. So $30 feeds a child for the whole year, and because we serve only the government schools, the government of India gives us 15, and we raise the other $15 to actually feed a child. So a $15 donation feeds a child for the whole year. And today, we have scaled it up to about 1.3 million every day. <laughs> but there is 120 million children that we need to feed, and the strategy to get there is to actually get to 5 million by 2020. At that point, it'll, the program will be so pervasive that everybody knows what's possible and everybody will demand it. But also, we just launched a pretty major program to train thousands of people in terms of how to actually run such kitchens. So, so this is probably one of the largest programs, food programs in the world. But this just tells you how problems are not really that complex in some ways. You know, if $30 gets you one meal, $60 two meals, a billion people, 60 billion problem solved. And 60 billion is not a big number given the economy, global economy that we have. So, the, so, so I know a lot of you will have a lot of questions. Uh, so I want to point out a couple of people here. Emily Rosenbaum is a CEO, she's here. And, and Piali Datta. Uh, is a director, and so, uh, you know, the organization itself is called Akshaya Patra. Patra stands for vessel. Akshaya is something that gives forever. So we want to make sure that when we serve these children, the children can eat as much food as they want. It's not a limited amount of food. Uh, and and uh, those of you uh, who are watching online won't have the ability to speak to us directly, so you can go to the website www.foodforeducation.org and, and you'll be able to get a lot of very good information there. So how can you help? I mean, every time we talk about this, I and Deepak talk about this program, people always say, but how come I didn't know about this, right? So the problem where I think need a lot of help is to actually spread the word. And so this is also an excellent platform for everything we've been talking about because I think the program is organized in a way so that thousands, millions of people can get involved. Some can give $15, some can give $15 million, some can give an hour, some can give their whole life, a whole year. But there is a way to sort of put it all together and get the like-minded people to come together and do something that's very meaningful. And, and, and in fact, Dalai Lama, His Highness, was there just a few weeks ago and, and he said, this is the way to fix the 21st century. And, 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 uh, and so I think, I think it's, a, it's a way to really get like-minded people together. And, and what I, Deepak, find is that every time we do these things, it just builds on energy. It builds on really a lot of people coming together because it's a lot of work at the end of the day for these people to get up at 2.30 in the morning and, and provide these meals every day. But the fact that there's so many people who are really thinking about it and care about it, actually gets that energy going. So the recipe for real change that we've been talking about is, is not to exclude businesses and to exclude nonprofits. You know, the businesses sometimes, they lose their way and they lose the compassion and they, they forget the environment and everything else, but one thing that's always given with businesses is execution excellence. If you have a restaurant, you don't serve good food, for a week, you're out of business. So execution excellence is what every business has to do. So I think bringing the execution excellence of a for-profit to the compassion of the non-profit, and then bringing the compassion of a non-profit to the execution excellence of the for-profit is, is a real way to make this a better world. Now, you know, when we started uh, the program in India, our thinking was that U.S. needs technological innovation, India needs social innovation. But then after we saw the success in India, we realized that U.S. needs just as much social innovation. So we started social innovation sandboxes in Lowell Lawrence in Massachusetts because we live in Boston. And Lawrence happens to be the 41st poorest town in the United States. And so, uh, so we have two more sandboxes, one in Canada and one in 
Lowell Lawrence. So the recipe for social innovation is, is what Subhash talked about the day before, I think, is to really light the flame, is to really inspire those people to come up with their own solutions, not to take the solution to them, which is what most of us do, because not, not in a bad sense, because a lot of us want to take something that we can give. And what can we give? A lot of ideas, and we're all very innovative and creative and so on. So in our desire to actually help other people, and there's also a little bit of ego involved in the process, you try to think about the whole solution and take the solution to these people. That's a failure. I think we all have to be creative in terms of making those people creative so that they can come up with solutions and they can be passionate about things. So when people are passionate about a solution, about a problem, they'll, they'll find a solution. So if we can somehow make millions and billions that Deepak is talking about, light the flame in those people, and if they all become change makers, ultimately, we'll just run out of problems to solve, right? Because when people really get inspired, every problem starts looking like an opportunity. And when it looks like an opportunity, people get excited, they make a commitment, and they actually go solve it. So I think that'll be a nice, nice problem to have when we run out of problems. So Deepak. <coughs> So just stay there. First of all, keep reminding people that uh, you should tweet this information. Tell your friends to retweet it. We are live on Ustream. Uh, this video will be posted on YouTube, Huffington Post, everywhere. So it can reach millions of people. Why is such a brilliant idea not scaled to the level that we actually don't have to wait till 2020 to reach those 5 million people or children and don't have to wait even longer to reach 100 yeah. million children. Uh, what we're learning from this, and I, I'm just going to ask you to speak on those three things. Compassion, creativity, impact. I mean, that's the mantra, right? If the mantra to solve any problem. Right. Any problem. Doesn't matter whether it's climate change, whether it's food, and what the great innovation here, by the way, is not only that kids are going to school, which they wouldn't have gone, they're getting nutrition, which they wouldn't have received, brain development, and education, uh, who knows, uh, they might take over your job at MIT. Absolutely, future, absolutely. So one yeah. or two of them. Yeah. So, yeah. And the other lessons we're learning here, GPS systems to saving energy, solar production, uh, local recipes, healthy food. Talk a little bit about the, uh, the nutritional Nutrition. value of the food, because as we said yesterday, half the world is obese, the other half is malnourished. Nobody actually gets nutrition. If you're rich, if you're, if you're a rich person, you're at risk for obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, etc., etc. And if you're extremely poor, you're at risk also. So we have a messed up world. And yet this simple meal, locally provided, is yeah. a, bringing a revolution in our understanding of what is good nutrition. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, I think we think about nonprofits. Typically, the nonprofits, what happens in the for profit is that if you have a product, if you have a market share, you're under tremendous amount of pressure from the competition, from your customers, and you have to go from 1.0 to 2.0 to 3.0 to 4.0 to actually survive. Whereas the nonprofits, because the people that you serve don't really have the buying power, Slowly over the course of time, nonprofits do something and then the improvement stops because you only have to please your donors, not the people that you serve. And so one of the good things that we really love about this organization is that the organization is very, very, very open to innovation. And, and we have a quality audit team that actually goes and visits a lot of these schools and visits and, and gives an annual report. Uh, and, the, and, and, and all the donors, you know, all the people that get involved, uh, in fact, uh, you know, Jim Walsh and Murray and their daughter, Ashley, 
uh, they're going to get involved in a big way. And, and I don't want to steal this thunder because Ashley is going to be speaking about it. But when people get involved, they bring a lot of ideas. And, and so we need to constantly, we get an opportunity to sort of inject those things. And it's a, it's a big organization now. 1.3 million, $30 is still $40 million a year program. So if somebody comes up and says, hey, I know how to improve the nutrition of, of a meal, uh, and, and I need a million dollars, no big deal. We can actually spend the million dollars to improve the meal. If somebody says, I know how to improve the process and save two pennies, we can spend the amount of money that we need to. So having those resources and having access and a distribution channel and, and ability to reach these many children, uh, you can actually make a meaningful difference. You know, my, my mom, always, I lost her last year, but, but every time I took her to the kitchen, she would be so impressed because when we were little, and Deepak, maybe same thing with you, uh, you know, the, uh, we all used to have a thing where those of us who could afford always fed one student one day a week, right? So one meal a week is all she could provide. And for her to actually see the 1.3 million meals being served every day was, was quite dramatic. And that's the big difference. That's the difference between 30, 40 years ago and what's happening today. And so we cannot have these two worlds, the world that we all live in, which is a very competitive world, and we, 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 we really, really innovate. We do a lot of good things to survive. And then the other world, which needs help, but, but the two are separate. And so we need to find a way to connect the two things to bring them along and, and, and really use a lot of these things that we use every day and, and make it their world. And so I'm a big believer in this, uh, you know, really bringing compassion to the whole world. So. Compassion, creativity, impact. That's the mantra. And uh, please get involved. Please uh, recycle this information as much as you can. And also, I think, uh, Desh, let's bring it out of India into Africa, into Food University with yeah. Alan Fleischman. Absolutely. Uh, into our own inner cities in the United yeah. States, yeah. which could need this, yeah. because you're not only solving the problem at a very fundamental level, you're creating new technologies. I mean, yeah. the, the nutritional uh, work is done by Cleveland Clinic, you said? Uh, well, I mean, you know, Conagra is, is probably the largest $17 billion company. They're very involved in, in sort of really looking at the nutrition and figuring out what's the best way to design the meal and so on. But the key thing, I think, is if we want to take it to other countries, is developing some local leadership, not taking a solution to them. In fact, you know, I, I, uh, Haiti, uh, the guy, Bill Clinton, does a midday meal program in Haiti, and they do 1,000 meals a day. And he thought that was big. So the person who ran, ran it, Ron, he had come to our conference, and he saw the kitchen. And then he said, hey, no, 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 you got to bring this guy Dash. So I, I flew to Haiti in, in Air Force One with Bill Clinton, Ban Ki-moon, all these people. And if we do one kitchen with 70,000 meals, we can feed every school, every hospital in Haiti. So it's not a big problem. It's a simple problem. We got the architecture done for kitchen and everything else. It's been three years. Nothing has happened. So local leadership is extremely important. You cannot take solutions to people. You have to somehow light that flame, inspire them, and get them excited. Because all of us can only be a catalyst. We are not there to do the job. But we can play a huge role in terms of enabling those people to do things. So in our own small way, Chopra Foundation, the Consciousness Project, is totally committed to this program. And you'll be hearing more about this later today, this morning. Desh, thank you Great. very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.